Hello everyone, welcome to my channel. So today's case is based in Wales near Swansea and this is the Clodagh murders case. This was a very big case in Wales at the time and it was a very big police investigation. So let's dive in. So Mandy Power and her daughters Katie and Emily and her mother Doris were bludgeoned to death at their home in Clidduck near Swansea in June 1999 and this was on Kelvin Road, 9 Kelvin Road. So Mandy at the time she was aged 34, her oldest daughter Katie was aged 10 and her youngest daughter Emily was age 8 and Mandy's mum Doris was age 80. Amanda, which is Mandy's real name, Mandy is her nickname to other people. She was a nurse and at age 16 she had met a man who later became her husband and his name was Michael Power. They had gotten married when Mandy was in her early 20s, Michael was a baker and Mandy was a nurse. So this is where they decided to um, get married and they wanted their own house but they didn't have enough money at this time so they came to a conclusion where they decided that the best thing for them was to move in with Mandy's mum Doris. So this is actually what they had done to save up for their own house. And Doris, she was a very loved and very liked woman in Clidduck. Everybody loved her, everybody enjoyed her company. She was a very lovely lady. So she was getting on with a lot of people. So at this time, when Mandy had moved in with her mum and Michael moved in too, Mandy had then fell pregnant with her first daughter and this was Katie. They had decided that they had some money where they had saved up and they decided to move out and move into their new home. This was Michael, Mandy and Katie. So Mandy got pregnant again and this was with her second child, Emily. Everything was going well and until a few years later when Michael came out of the blue and he decided that this is not what he wanted anymore. He didn't want to be committed. He didn't want to be married. He just didn't feel that fatherly energy, that husband um, energy about him, he just didn't want that anymore. So he decided that he wanted to up, leave, move out and he tried seeking for a divorce. And this is where some rumours was going around, I'm not too sure if it's true or not, but apparently Mandy was having an affair at this time. Um, like I said, if it's true or not, I'm not entirely sure. When Mandy and Michael had then separated, they had their divorce and they went their separate ways. The house was left to Mandy and the children while Michael went on his own way. So from there on out, Mandy had struggled a lot. She struggled with the children, with her job and there was not enough income coming in for them. So she had gone and found out that her mother, Doris, had been suffering from a brain hemorrhage and that she needed a lot of care. So she had decided that it is time for her and her children to move out and move in with Doris to help look after Doris at this time. And it was that sense of easier, like, with Mandy, she didn't have to fork out on a lot of money for a house. She had been there living with her mum her and her children would be there looking after Doris. And everything was going all happy, um, happy families and everything just started to go really well for them. And where she couldn't afford it, she was getting a bit, you know, put down all the time. So what she decided was there was a house that was up for sale and this was in Kelvin Road and this was number nine Kelvin Road. So she, her and her mother decided to buy this house. So this is when the four of them had moved in together. So this would be Mandy, Mandy's mum and the two children. And this was in Clidduck. And it got to a point where 
Mandy wasn't having this time to herself. She didn't have nothing to occupy her. She couldn't go out on dates. She couldn't have any friends. And she just didn't have that time where she was always working with a job and always looking after her mum, looking after her children as well. And she started to get a bit down. She just did not have a life outside her home. So Mandy had decided to go on some dates. And Mandy then had decided that she wanted to sign up and take up in a woman's rugby team. And where she had been in this rugby team, she had started to be very close. And she had a best friend from that team. And her name was Alison Lewis. And that Alison Lewis was a former police officer at the time, but she decided that she wanted to quit the police force due to some mental health issues she had at this time. Mandy and Alison was inseparable until it came to a sudden end on June the 27th, 1997 at 4.27am until the police had received a very frantic call from Kelvin Road about a fire at number 9 Kelvin Road. The firefighters, police, ambulances all went to the scene and when they checked it out, the fire was mainly coming from the kitchen and this house had been Doris's and Mandy's house. So there had been a lot of damages within this kitchen it was a big massive blaze so the firefighters was focusing on dousing this house and there was a lot of people that was out in the street they was talking amongst themselves and there had been um a contact then with mandy's sister so mandy's sister had then been contacted about the incident and she got straight to the scene very much straight away and then she had been there at about 5 a.m that morning and she didn't know if there was anyone inside at this time same as the firefighters the police and the ambulance also as well as soon as the firefighters controlled the fire and all the flames was gone, the firefighters had run inside to try and inspect the whole house. They were looking everywhere in the house to see if there was anyone inside. And that the paramedics stayed outside setting all their equipment up and they had this put out on the garden lawn. When the firefighters went upstairs, the first firefighter was feeling his way around the floor. They all had to go on their hands and knees at this time because there was so much smoke that was smouldering. They had to get down to their feet and their knees to the ground. Um, so they was going up the stairs on their hands and their knees. So they tried feeling their way up then and this is where he started feeling his way across the floor and this was on the landing upstairs. So when they had gone down very low to the ground, um, the firefighter was using his hands to feel his way around and then that is it when he had first the felt, felt the first victim, sorry. Um, and this victim was 10 year old Katie. They had gone and carried Katie out and they put it out on the grass and the paramedics started to work on Katie at this time. And while the firefighters headed back upstairs and went into the first room, which was the two girls bedroom, this is where they had found eight year old Emily and they carried her out also onto the grass where the paramedics was working on her. Then the firefighters had went back in then upstairs and this is when they had gone straight into Doris's bedroom. And when they got into Doris's bedroom, this is where they had found Mandy. She was naked, she was very much unconscious. So she was carried out and she was put onto the grass to be worked on also. And this is where the paramedics was working on all of them. So it was Mandy, Katie and Emily all lying next to each other, all being worked on, trying to scare them, you know, responsive at this time. So... This is when one of the paramedics had spotted some blood on their bodies and the paramedics tried their best to tr try and resuscitate all of them but this was when it was too late. They was pronounced dead at the scene. So they tried their best um, 
they tried and tried and this is where they decided they can't try no more and they just like they deceased so they had left them there while the firefighters ran back inside so this is when they went back inside to find doris in her own room dead in her bed so she had already been dead so they had left doris in her bed until the coroners had then turned up to the crime scene and with this they came in to uh, remove doris um properly um as coroners do and there was an inspection on all of the bodies where there had been a lot of blood on them. And apparently there was some difficulty with getting the oxygen masks on the um, on Mandy and the two children at this time. And when this was going on, they had found that there was a disfigurement to the heads of them. And there was a lot of head injuries and they had confirmed that the fire was not the cause of their deaths. And it was confirmed that there was head injuries that had caused their deaths. And the pathologist, yeah, the pathologist, sorry, I, oh, I get my words confused all the time. They had confirmed that there was a heavy long pole that had been the murder weapon. And it turns out this is what they used to bludgeon the victims. So Doris was the first victim to die in her bed. And the murderer had went to hit Doris with um, this pole. And when they had gone to swung this pole, this is when they had actually hit the light bulb. And they had gone and blew the fuse to all the electrics in the house. And after the killer had murdered Doris, they tried to fix this fuse. So they went into the children's room and there was a TV set that was on the chair. So the killer then had took the TV, put it on the bed and then and they carried it downstairs to the bathroom where the fuse box was at the time. And they had gone and stood on this chair, opened the fuse box and fixed the fuse and switched all the lights back on. So this is showing that the killer had plenty of time um, to be around in this house. And it's like this killer knew the ins and outs of this house to know where the fuse box was, to know where the chair was. So this is one theory about it that is someone that the family knew. Um, or they already been in the house before. So there was no blood that was on this chair, but on the TV set, it had blood. Um, so Emily's murder must have happened after the TV and the chair was removed. And this goes to show then that it was premeditated murder. And Mandy was the worst beaten out of the lot of the family. And it was almost 40 injuries to her body. So it is said that she was the main focus of this attack. So Mandy's skull had been broken into 10 pieces and she had been strangled where she had been beaten in the head badly. Her tooth had then came out and there was a lot of self-defense wounds that was on her hands and on her arms as well. And it was said that she was sexually assaulted as well. And with a sexual um, toy that had been placed inside of her, um, this is what had been used for the sexual assault, but there was no semen on or inside Mandy at all. Mandy was found with a men's wristwatch then that was on her wrist and Mandy had never been the type to wear anything of this such. Um, so the attack of Mandy had begun in Mandy's bedroom and it had spanned into multiple rooms and areas trying to get away from her attacker. So the blood drops that was the pathological people had found uh, said that by the way the blood shape had been from her room to the children's room then into her mother's bedroom that is where the attack had ended. There was a cross-shaped wound that was in Mandy's head which matched to a certain object that was in her mother's room and this was the dressing table. And Emily was found then with several teeth missing. 
which had then been found on her bedroom floor. Emily was particularly um, partially dressed, showing no signs of sexual assault. So this means that she was in the middle of getting on her pajamas um, when she had got attacked. Ten-year-old Katie, who was found on the landing then, had been beaten so bad that her brain was exposed and her brain had been put multiple times with a murder weapon. So Katie was the last then person to die due to where she was found and due to the blood of hers that was on the murder weapon. It took three weeks for the investigation, meaning that it had been the Wills' longest one at that time. They had searched everywhere for evidence and it was a separate four fires which had been combined into one. So the first fire of the house was lit in Doris's bedroom um, that was at 2am and the fourth fire was lit at 4am in the kitchen. All of the rooms that was upstairs had blood spatter on the walls and in the bathroom there had been a bath that was filled with water and also had some blood within that bath water. There was no blood spatter in the bathroom so it shows that the killer tried to wash the blood off themselves um, into this bathtub. It had been before leaving the scene. There was a white sock that was found that had a lot of blood on it and it was found to be in multiple areas where there had been fibres of this sock in many places so that the killer may have used it as a glove or to go on the weapon. Um, so with that, um, a men's chain that had been found um, that had been the police thought that this was a very big important piece of the puzzle of this murder and it is said then that um, with this chain it was very much important it was covered in blood and it was a very unique piece of a jewelry and that the neighbour then that was opposite was the one who had noticed this big fire um, hearing that it was a very big loud noise that was coming outside and he had looked out of the window to see that the neighbour's house had become big blare up of this flames. It was just a, a big fire that had just been going on blazing through this house and he tried to call Mandy but there was no one that was answering her phone so then he had tried then to ring the landline Mandy's landline to the house and still there was no answer so he put on his dressing gown and his slippers and he then ran to Mandy's banging down the house door and then shouting to get an answer and there was no answer and this is when another neighbour came running out over to the house and both the neighbours ran to the back of the house to see that the blaze was in the kitchen at this time. This blaze was very big and that they tried breaking the door down to get inside but when they did do that they were hit by the almighty heat from this fire, the blaze. This is when the smoke started coming out, coming at them and they thought right, this fire is way too big, This we could hurt ourselves in the long run if we ended up going in there as well. So they did not run into the house. So within the hours of the turning up of the emergency services, they had pronounced the deaths to Michael Power. And this was obviously Mandy's ex, the husband, um, the ex-husband and the father of the children that had been informed of this devastating news and as he had got to the bakery the police arrived and this is where they broke the news to him and with that they had been seeing that Michael was very much distraught at this time losing his only children and it took two months for Michael to actually speak publicly about the incident as it badly affected him and everyone around them. Everyone then had said that Mandy and the family didn't have any enemies at all. So it had been so very personal that the police could not find any suspects to try and look into. 
So they did a draft of all the potential suspects, like her lovers, her friends, including exes like Michael, but he had been ruled out and he actually had an alibi at this time. The night before the children had stayed over Michael's new place with Michael and his girlfriend, and then the morning after Mandy had picked the children up, so Michael had been one of the last ones to see them. There was a lot of remembrance things that was put outside their home at this time. You know, the days after putting a lot of flowers, putting some little notes down as you know, remembrance to the family. And there had been a very big turnout for the funerals. Mandy's flings had also been questioned at this time as well and a year and a half had went by with no leads. A lot of public appeals was going on especially by um, this chain. So one man was identified and the man called in to the tip line to say that the chain looked quite exactly the same as his cousins did and his cousin's name was David George Morris and his nickname his well-known name is Di Morris and this man had spoken to David and David had said that he was anxious with getting caught up in this case because he knows he left his chain at Mandy Power's home and at the time of the murder he had been having an affair with Mandy and accidentally left his chain at home the day of the murder. And when the police found this out, they had gone and arrested David. When the police had questioned David about the chain, David had then denied it being his um, put down. He had gone and opened up then down the line and said, yeah, it is mine. And this had been when um, he admitted to it. And so they had run David's name in a database and they found out that he had a big criminal history and this is dating back to the age of 14. This was involvement of drugs, robberies, thefts, street fights, an assault at a funeral, five years in jail for a house burglary as well. There had also been some driving offences as well. David was aged 38, he had been a scrap metal dealer and he had had some um, children also, they were three young girls and he was previously married but divorced due to domestic violence. So when he was having an affair with Mandy Power, he was in a long term relationship with another Mandy and the neighbours had witnessed David screaming and shouting at his girlfriend and hitting her with a shovel in a garden. There had been some neighbours then that had gone to try and break it up but David then had gone and turned on them and he had threatened them. So the night of the murders he was at a local club, pub sorry, um, with his girlfriend and friends that he got into an argument with. And he had gone into an argument with his girlfriend at this time and his girlfriend got very upset. She had gone, she had got up and she had just left the pub and she had just left him. Um, she just went on her own way. People had said then at that night, David had um, become very aggressive as the night had gone by. And with that, at 11 p.m., he told his friends that he was leaving the pub and he was going to Mandy Powers to go and have sex with her. And at that, he had gone and said that he was going to Mandy Powers, didn't go anywhere else. So David left the pub, um, walked to uh, Mandy Powers's at 11 p.m. This is the theories that the police are saying um, and demanded sex with Mandy and she had refused and David didn't like it. So in his drug drank state, he had gone into Mandy's and murdered them all. So this is some theories that the police have uh, been saying. And that Mandy tried to grab David in self-defense and grabbed his chain and it had broke off. So David gave a alibi to the police saying that he left the pub and was going to his mother's. But it was raining so he walked back to his flat. The crime scene investigator said that someone who did the fire must have been very much sober. Um, 
and also that if it was someone like David who had been drunk um, that also would have been on drugs planned it all out it would not have been in a sound mind so if they was to go ahead and do this murder then you had to be sober you had to have a good mind so if you've been drinking and been on drugs you're not going to be in a sound mind you're not going to you're not going to premeditate it basically as they they'd say so out of that then it was saying that um as perfectly as it was done david would have been put on trial and he had been found guilty of all the murders and sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 32 years david his family and a lot of the community are saying that they believe that david is very much innocent and that the south wales police are known as being very much corrupt and there is to be said of miscarriages of justice and convicting a lot of wrong people at that time and it was said that the police were bullies um they bullied suspects and they would get them to write confession letters forcing the suspect then to sign them and apparently they had bribed people fabricated evidence records notes and some notes and evidence miraculously disappeared and go missing or they end up being damaged and there had been um, 19 wrongful convictions that was linked to the south wales police this is what was being said by multiple people at my day of the murders a woman called nicola um, had approached the police saying that she thought that she seen something very suspicious the night before that she had been driving home in the Cladduck area which is near Kelvin Road at 2am around the time of the murder she had saw a man walking on the pavement and she had drove to the side of the pavement she had rolled her window down and to see if she knew this person because all the people that is in Cladduck area they know a lot of each other and they would give each other lifts they would um, basically known each other that much they would just pick them up in the car do you want to lift basically you know in Wales that is some some people do tend to do if they know um they just are from a ride um, so in this instance when she put the window down and she noticed that this man looked down at her um, the man looked straight into the car and she noticed that she did not know this man so this is when she decided to pull her window back up and then drove away so she was saying that his description was he was a tall white man six foot in his 30s to 40s very stocky wearing jeans carrying a bag and wearing a very shiny bomber jacket that was very similar to what police officers wear and this is very significant in the rest of the story that i'm going to be saying very soon so she had gone to a sketch artist to do the sketch of this man and she said that the sketch that they had done was 90 percent accurate so this sketch was never released which seemed very suspicious very very suspicious so on the morning of the bodies of the discovery um alison lewis was at the home um and she had helped to identify everyone and she seemed very distraught the police found that this was a sorrow that had stemmed from much more than losing of a very close friend it had been said that mandy and allison had been having a affair a lesbian affair mandy was single but then allison on the other hand had a family and she was also married she had an husband allison had told people that she could not live without mandy and that she tried jumping out of her own window and the police had questioned allison in case she had been a suspect she was very honest about the relationship but she kept it as a secret as for Alison's husband at the time, he had also been 
a police officer and had a identical twin that the twin had worked on this case as well being a police officer so there was a conversation stating that um, if you don't tell your husband about the affair then we will so this is what the police had gone and said to Alison, if you don't tell your husband you're having the affair or you had this affair behind your husband's back, then we will have to tell them. Everyone needs to know the truth. So Alison then had told her husband about this affair and her husband said that he was going to divorce her after she had told him about the affair. They were said that Mandy had then lied to Alison about having cervical cancer and Alison had put herself in a very big psychiatric unit as well and police could not um, question Alison. So on the morning of the murders, she was one of the first people to arrive at the scene even though she did not live close to this place. When Alison got released from the psychiatric place, from the psychiatric place, sorry, the police wanted to know how Alison was one of the people to arrive at that um, early time when she didn't live near that place. She, it's like, how did she find out about it? If they felt that it was a bit suspicious, how she just knew that this was going on and she didn't live very close to Mandy's property at the time. So Alison had said that she told the police that she had heard about the fire on Kelvin Road at around 6am and one of her friends um, that knew Alison and Mandy was friends with them had gone and told Alison about the fire on the street of Kelvin Road and that Alison phoned her husband who was just about to go to work. Um, so he did not go to work. He had turned the car around and picked Alison up and took her straight to Kelvin Road. And this was to see her best friend to see what was going on. And around 8am, they arrived at 9 Kelvin Road, which was Mandy and Doris's and the children's home. So Alison's story did not live up to the same as multiple witnesses' stories. So the neighbours said that the timings were very much off with what Alison was saying and that Mandy had confided in someone saying that Alison's husband threatened Mandy to stay away from Alison or he would kill her. There was another neighbour that witnessed Alison's husband shouting at Mandy and Mandy was in her doorway and she was crouched over looking as if she was defending herself and that Alison's husband was on the steps and Mandy's daughters was next to Mandy on the steps crying because of this incident. The sketch that Ma uh, Nicola had drawn, had drawn, sorry, um, looked pretty similar to Alison's husband and also Alison's husband's twin. On the night of the murder, Alison's husband's twin was on duty and he was patrolling Clidic streets at this time. And this was from the time of 12 p.m. to 3 a.m. And he went off radar and one of the taxi drivers had then said that there was a man that was in the street that was in a red Peugeot and Alison's husband's twin had a red Peugeot. And so this had been, the case had been handled um, by the police force and that the police force had to try and invest to get in another police force. So where they were saying that the twin had a red Peugeot and the red Peugeot had been seen, they were said that the police of the Clidac, the ones that was investigating the Kelvin road fire they were saying that them police officers didn't do what they were supposed to do there was something fishy and very suspicious going on so the out of police that is not in Clidac, um had to go and as they say um how can i say it? they had gone and looked at the police officers um, about the suspicion um, to try and handle the Clidac case because where really it was very suspicious involving two police officers initially as suspects that they needed to look further into this case. So 
where they had to investigate the Clidac police force due to the sp suspicions. Um, when the paramedics told the police, which was Alison's husband's twin, that it was a murder, he was supposed to tell the other police officers of Clidac and write it on record in which he did none of those things. He did not even seal the area off which he was supposed to do. The police had then arrested Alison and her husband on suspicion of murder. Also, the twin was arrested on trying to interfere within it as well. The twin was released and had been suspended until a disciplinary was put in place. And the police had then also confronted him with this police sketch and had said, like, this is you um, and this is your twin. This is basically both of your twin as you know, the sketch is identical to you both. Um, so they had been, if there had been a DNA at the crime scene, then the did the, then the twins then had didn't be tested with this DNA that was um, supposedly been in the crime scene. So then um, Alison and her husband had been in custody. Her husband um, had been in a photo lineup, um, in a lineup in the police station where Nicola had come in and she had to look at these people that was in this lineup to see if any of these males was one of their males that she had seen when she rolled her window down to Avalok to see if it's someone she knew. Um, when she looked at them, it was no one she knew. So she knew all the descriptions and everything about this person. So when she had looked at this um, lineup of people, the first person she picked out straight away was the husband, which was um, Stephen Lewis. And he was the one that had been walking by Calvin Road the night of the murders. So Nicola had said then when they had convicted David, he was not the man that she had seen that night. It was Stephen Lewis. There was a DNA match that was on Mandy's thigh that had turned into being Alison's vaginal DNA type. So in 2002 then, years and years after, David Morris was convicted of the murders by a unanimous verdict at Swansea Crown Court. His conviction was overturned on an appeal due to um, a conflict of interest by a defence solicitor. A retrial was held then at Newport Crown Court in 2006 and David was convicted yet again. He was sent to life imprisonment following the death then of David Morris on the 20th of August 2021. Permission was given by his family to obtain a blood sample to allow some forensic examinations to take place. So that is what I could find on this case. It is a very big case and it is still technically ongoing with this blood type of David's to see if he actually had anything um, any DNA going on in that house. So, what do you think? Do you think that David is innocent or do you think he is guilty? Do you feel that the twins are to blame or if they are the ones that's the murderers or not? What do you think? Please comment in the comment section below. I'd love to see your thoughts and I hope you enjoy my videos. Um, I also have two extra YouTube channels. I have one tarot uh, YouTube channel and I also have a tarot and a true crime um, YouTube channel as well. So the tarot one is Natalie the Divine and the other one which is true crime and tarot that is my second YouTube channel and this is my third one. I hope you enjoy all my videos and until next time take care.